Who's a pick and mix fan? Yeah, okay. Now, unfortunately, due to the rules, I will not be able to share my pick and mix today. There you go. Um, and I haven't found a way yet of sending them over the airwaves. So if you're watching online, you are missing out. Although if you've got one, we will come back to that later. I'm only mentioning it now just to tease you about what it uh, what it's might be. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Judges. Uh, it's the seventh book in your Bible. If you're new to Christianity, you don't have your Bible or have no idea where to start, don't worry. It'll come up on the screen. But if you flip through from the beginning, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, I still remember the names of the books of the Bible from my school days where you learned everything in rote learning and you had to repeat it and write it out. And anyone else remember those days? Don't seem to have to do that anymore, do you? You don't even have exams. You can do coursework at your own pace when you want. Um, Coursework's probably good. I probably would have done a lot better if I had coursework at school. So today, you might be relieved to hear, is the last sermon in the book of Judges. Yeah, you're allowed to say, yay, it's all right, you won't be thrown out of church. Um, some of you are thoroughly disappointed because you have loved the book of Judges. Um, it's been a pretty hard-hitting series in many, many ways. Um, there are lots of aspects you can preach on through the book of Judges. But we've really been trying to focus on the heart issue. And the heart issue, we've seen the cycle, haven't we, through the book of Judges. The cycle of God's people who go from sin and rebellion, then they go as a result of their choices. If you like, God gives them what they wanted. They face oppression from their enemies. And then there's this repentance or this saying sorry. Repentance is a Bible word which means a total change of heart or total change of mind and direction. And there's this repentance, a crying out to God. But the more you go through the book of Judges, you wonder if it is actually a repentance, and it's more a bit of a regret. And then God delivers them in His grace and His mercy, as would be the story of many of us here. And then there's a season of peace, and then the cycle starts again and again. And through the whole book, there's this growing sense of, this is a surface level sense of spirituality it's not seemingly in many of the cases not a deep repentance it's not a grieving over the fact that they have wronged God ultimately that's what sin and repentance comes to it's the fact that when we sin we have grieved first and foremost God by doing other things and the true sign of repentance is that if our grief is actually that we have wronged God and we're severing our relationship somehow on the other side you get the sense of regret, oh, I was caught out, oh, didn't, things didn't work out well, things have been a bit more difficult, I regret I was foolish, I regret the consequences rather than the sorrow of my sin. And you, we get the flavor of that. That's where this whole book has really been taking us, to try and get us to understand the real depth of our sin, which is actually rooted deep in our hearts. And often what we think and talk about of as sin is sin, but it's really, it's the presenting issue. And there's a sin beneath the sin. And there's a sin beneath that sin. And really the root sins are sins of unbelief and idolatry in the heart. When we put other things as the primary thing in our life. The thing that drives our decisions and our worship. And all the other things that we do are a result often of that. And for many, many, many years and many in your experience, you can go to churches and as Christians, and I've been the finger pointing one, you can focus on behavior modification. Don't do that, do this, fix that, behave like this. And the moment you seem to behave like that, everyone's happy. When really your heart can not have changed at all. That's important. How we honor God with our actions is important, but they are reflective of what's going on in, in the heart. And through the book of Judges, there's been a broad bird's eye view, if you like. We've never actually been given much detail as to the nature of daily nitty-gritty life for the people of God. We've been given these phrases such as, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And I'm not saying that's not important, but it's been a sweeping statement. It's been a generalization. They generally did evil in the eyes of God, and God delivered them. But at the end of the book of Judges, 17, 18, 19, and onwards, there are two major episodes that bring down to what daily life is like when you are rebelling and walking away from God's and not truly repentant, and are an idol worshiper. And we're not talking about idols that you carve out of stone. Idols are things that we put on the throne of our hearts, the things that are most important to us that drive our lives. 
And we're just going to focus on one, probably the milder episode of what happens in chapter 17 today because of time. But I do want to encourage you to read the rest of Judges. It's a harrowing story of what life ends up like when you're not walking closely with God. And my title today is Convenient Worship. Can you say that? You're allowed to speak, just don't shout it. Convenient Worship. Now, what comes to mind when you hear that title? I mean, is there such a thing? Because as we will see, whilst giving the appearance of worship to God, they had made God out to be who they wanted Him to be, which is the great challenge that the church faces in the West these days. They had made God, these people we're going to read about, a deity who was to serve at their convenience. They have photoshopped Him. They've smoothed out the blemishes. They've adjusted the curves. They've changed the lighting, and they've eventually found an image that says, ah, that works for me. Has anyone seen the Dove adverts recently where they show how you change the image of someone to portray what you want? But then you see the real person. <laughs> they look nothing like the same as the image they've done. Convenient worship airbrushes God and picks and chooses the bits that suit us for our convenience. And whilst we might think that's a problem outside the doors, it's far closer to home than we might think. And we're going to focus on this first episode with a guy called Micah, uh, a priest, a Levite priest, and a few other bits of details like, and it gives us a somber picture of what life that chooses convenient worship looks like. So let's pray together. Oh Jesus, we love you. We thank you for that line in the song. I can't remember it exactly, but this gospel will never bend nor shake or change. The gospel, the good news of how God has created a people, how they rebelled, but he pursued them even to death on the cross so as to win them for himself. We thank you this same God is present here now. Present in this room is no less powerful one than the one who defeated the grave. <coughs> and we invite you, Jesus, to come and speak to us and work in our hearts and bring freedom and salvation. Come, Holy Spirit. <laughs> we need your help. <laughs> uh, we need you. We need you to soften our hearts. We need you to help us want to know the truth. We need you to help us see through the lies around us to the truth of the heart and the means of God for our salvation. We invite you and we posture our hearts as best as we can that you would come and speak to us and free us. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay, so chapter 17 Verse 1, there was a man from the hill country of Ephraim named Micah. Can you say Micah? He said to his mother, the 1,100 or 1,100 pieces of silver taken from you, and that I heard you place a curse on, here's the silver, I took it. Quite an abrupt beginning. Clearly what's happened is Micah has pinched some of his mum's money, and his mum thinking, it would never be my little boy. She's uttered a curse over the person who has gone and done it. Micah overhears this curse and so returns the money. But he's returning the money to avoid the curse as opposed to having wronged his mum, it seems. That's the evidence. I want to escape the curse. Mum, here's your money back. Mum, obviously, is super grateful. She takes the money and then she says, <coughs> I personally consecrate the silver to the Lord for my son's benefit to make a carved image and a silver idol. Verse 4, so he returned the silver to his mother and she took five pounds of silver and gave it to a silversmith and he made it into a carved image and a silver idol and it was in Micah's house. Maybe you're starting to see some of the problems in this episode. And it goes on, this man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and a household idols and he installed one of his sons to be the priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what seemed right to him. And we see, before we even go further, in just these few verses, that convenient worship picks and mixes. So here's this pick and mix that we got for my daughter's birthday. Now, I, I should have set this up better to illustrate it, but you can clearly see some of the, some of the things are empty. You've got these little tweezers. How cool is that? Not that they actually work. No one uses them, but... You go in, some of them are empty because those are the ones that taste nice. 
Some of them have hardly been touched. These strawberry ones. Has anyone come across these strawberry sweets before? They're like little strawberry sweet sugar. No one likes them in our house except, well, I'll have any sugar. So I'm the only one who eats them. But when it comes to pick and mix, we love sweets, don't we? But even with things we like, we tend to pick and choose the bits and pieces that we want. Because when you look at the story, it can, when you're doing it in your Bible reading and you're just trying to get through your chapter, which is never great, you can read over this and think, oh, he's worshiping. He's consecrated the silver and idol to the God. It looks like worship. The mother consecrates the silver. The carved image was probably meant to resemble God. They weren't worshiping the Baals or the Dagon, who were the false gods of the time. They weren't obviously worshiping other gods. Of course not. They were worshiping the Lord. They have the appearance of being true worshipers. They would probably even claim to be Christians, although at that stage, just God followers. Probably they've rejected other false gods, but, but, but they are not worshipping the true God. They have picked and they've mixed what they want and how they want to do it. They're worshipping God as seems right to them or as is convenient to them, not as how God has commanded them. They picked and mixed and airbrushed and photoshopped and done what seemed right to them, what was convenient. They've broken the second commandment, which is not to make any carved images of God. We know that one, don't we? If you've ever been anywhere near Sunday school or heard the church, don't make any idols. Have you ever thought actually why? The reality is that when you make any image, painted or imaginary, you always accentuate one aspect of God's character and you miss thousands of other aspects of God's character. So if you were to close your eyes for a moment and picture Christ, what comes to mind? Some of you, rightly so, have a gentle and tender Jesus who is looking out from the cross with brokenness and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That is true. Christ is like that. Others of us, we have a fierce and awesome God surrounded by light and angels of purity and holiness. That's true. God is like that. The problem with making any image or picture, you can't capture all of that at the same time. Yes, God hates sin and He is the judge of all and yet He's the merciful and tender Savior. So that's why that, that's why that command is there because anytime you make an image, you can easily, consciously or subconsciously, promote the aspect of God that you most think about or you most like about God and even if it's subconscious, you end up ignoring a load of other aspects of God. We are not to make these images or cough things because it leads to pick and mix worship. At worst, at best, it's, we just tend to miss aspects of who God is. Micah made a temple in his home <laughs> and he installed his son as a priest. He shouldn't have done either of those. God had commanded where the tabernacle, the sanctuary should be and those who should be priests should be Levites. They chose to revise God and his commands and do what seemed right in their own eyes. I hope you get an idea with their phrase. It was convenient for them. Have you ever heard someone say this? Or have you ever said it? I don't believe in a God like that. I like to think of God as... Now that's not always right. Sometimes we say that as Christians in defense. I, I don't believe in a God like that. I like to think. But there's the phrase, isn't it? I wonder if you've ever had someone when you're talking about Christ, I don't believe in a God like that. I like to think of God as, it's a telling phrase. I like to think, now, not all of it's wrong because what we mean by that sometimes is the aspect of God, I'm particularly promoting an aspect today is this aspect of God and you can't cover it all at once. But that is often what comes against us when we speak about God. I like to think of God as, we live in a time like this, when we are told that you should do what seems right to you. What is the phrase of our age? Be true to your... Man, that feels good, doesn't it? Be true to your... Some of the biggest mega churches in the States, you can listen and with all humility, and I don't think I'm the greatest preacher in the world, but I try to preach the Bible. It feels like a self-help book that says be true to your self. I mean, it, it can happen. I mean, I, I've preached unhealthily like that before. And I, 
It's nice. Be true to yourself. And interestingly, those who shout the loudest, be true to yourself, except when being true to yourself means holding a view that challenges me being true to myself. <laughs> then you can't hold that view. But, but I'm being true to myself. What about the rest of the world that holds very different views to the West? It just doesn't work, does it? Be true to yourself doesn't work. We need a sovereign being who is wiser, superior, kinder, more loving, more knowledgeable to say this is who you are, be like this. Be true to yourself does not work. It leads to imprisonment, it leads to conflict, it leads to aggression, it leads to hurts, and it leads to pain, all in the name of being free. Now the church have got it wrong <laughs> at other times in saying other things. I'm not saying that we've had it perfect, but that is the lie of our age. Be true to yourself. Do what seems right to. It's the same thing, isn't it? And here are in the pages of Judges. When it comes to your spiritual life, what this looks like, convenient worship, is you will not let God be himself, but it causes you consciously or subconsciously to redefine God in a way that suits you. And that's worshipping who you wish God to be. Tim Keller puts it like this. He says, what we're really saying is our culture's distaste for this idea means we must just drop it. We must have a God that fits our culture's sensibilities. And like Micah's family, instead of letting God reshape our hearts, we reshape him to fit our society and our hearts. It's so true, isn't it? Inside the church, we can, on, we can think it's people out there, but inside the church, this is when people sleep together outside of marriage and they say, we prayed about it and we felt at peace. That's got nothing to do with it, whether you felt at peace or not. When the word of God is black and white, it's in the church when we are not generous and put God first with our money, whatever that looks like, and we hold on to it. The Bible has a lot to say about money, but we say, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not telling you... That don't dismiss this point because you're like, he wants your money. No, if you're uncomfortable giving it, yeah, give it to Jesus somewhere else, okay? But do something with your money that put God first. But we can so easily say, I'm not comfortable with that. And it goes against the clear teaching of God that everything you have is from him to be given away. It's when in the church, we view being committed to a local church as unnecessary and pick and choose. The Bible's clear. You need to be knitted in and committed to a people of God. And we want that to be here if God is calling you. But if not, we want to help you find somewhere you are comfortable. Help us do that. It's when we choose a living, working, financial or relational situation for convenience and for pleasure rather than prioritizing this question. What honors God the most? What has God commanded? What does God want? Because what's going on in your heart is a submission to God or a reshaping of God to how you want Him to be. I don't think of God as that. I like to think of God as... I like to think he's okay with this. I like to think this is the way God is. Another example, more subtle, is when Christians deliberately withhold forgiveness because it makes them feel good and makes the other person suffer. We just hold it against them, although we've known we've received mercy and we're not and we're to forgive. As one preacher puts it, just admit it, that what seems right in your own eyes has more weight than what God's word says. It's true, isn't it? There are so many aspects of our lives, obvious or subtle. True worship is not convenient. Because worship is an issue of the heart, and the greatest battle of your heart is who is the Lord. It's costly, true worship. It confronts our self-serving, comforting hearts. Not just so that God is God and we must obey His commands, so that you might know true freedom, true liberty, and true life. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6, and you have to reconcile this as a Christian. And if I may, I think by the grace of God, the, one of the cultures in our church to celebrate is that unbelievers, or those who are working out who Jesus are, are welcome to come in, and feel as comfortable as possible because of the things we do. And that where they feel uncomfortable and challenged is because of the word of God. I think that's a positive thing about our church. Maybe you're here today and you wouldn't call yourself a believer or you're working out who Jesus is. You are so welcome. And we don't want anything we do or our manner to be the reason you don't come back. But the word of God confronts Christians as much as non-Christians. 
because it goes for the heart. And I never want you to come here for 10 weeks and walk away and think that was nice and never give Jesus another thought because we haven't preached the word of God that comes to bear on your heart. If you come and you hear the word of God and the reason you leave is because you are choosing not to accept the word of God, that's hard, but as long as that's the reason and it's not because we've done something foolishly. But to become a Christian, you have to reconcile that worship is not convenient. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to him. Do you not know, speaking to the Christian, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. You are not your own, brothers and sisters. I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. I am Christ's. I don't get to redefine what he wants and who he is. I get to line up my life with him. And the reason I chose that by his grace is because I know that's the best way possible. When you come to Jesus, part of being saved is reconciling yourself to the fact that we don't get to choose who God is. He declares who he is. And he is mighty and strong and holy and powerful and terrifying. And he is kind and gentle and loving. There is none like him. So a few questions. Have you made worship convenient? Where in your life is convenience trumping obedience? What areas of your life are you keeping hidden or unknown to others and therefore making yourself more easily deceived or unaware of areas where you might be choosing convenience about worship? Convenient worship picks and mixes, and it does so, my second point, to use God. Chapter 17 goes on to tell how a Levite, which was the priestly clan, okay, who priests were meant to come from the tribe of Levi. They left Bethlehem, and they were wandering around, and Micah meets this priest in verse 10 and says to him, Stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes for your living. And the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Remember, who was the priest before this? Micah's son. But now Micah could upgrade his spiritual status by making sure he had a Levite as a priest. Even though he's paying the guy some silver to do it, and this guy should only be a priest where God said he should be. Verse 13 is the telling verse, and we start to end with this. Then Micah said, now I know. I've got the shrine and these carved images, but I've got a Levite priest. Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite priest. All along, Micah's been trying to reshape God to prosper him. Micah believes that if he does the right things, God's like a puppet on strings. I didn't even plan that rhyme. That's quite good. If he does the right things, God's like a puppet on strings. And if he does the right things, God will prosper him. God will serve him. Convenient faith seeks access to God to get him to do what you want. True faith gives God access to your heart so that he can tell you what he wants. Now it's true. There is fruit and blessing that comes with obedience. And there is the favor of God. The most common thing I'm praying at the moment is Psalm 5 verse 12. God surround me with favor as with a shield. It's a faith declaration. But the heart of it, I hope and I trust, is not that so that you prosper me. Following God, pursuing him, surrendering him, brings alongside trials, which we're promised, fruitfulness and blessing. And so as we come to an end, what kind of God are you serving? Where in your life are you doing what seems right to you? Where in your life have you not even asked the question, which is probably the reality for most of us. We're just presuming and we haven't looked at areas of life and think, am I putting God first in this area? Hey, let me have a friend to come alongside and ask me, how are you doing in this part of your life, in this part of your life, in this part of your life, and going to a bit more depth than 
the obvious stuff. What kind of God are you serving? And where are you thinking, if I do that, the Lord will prosper me? Now that's slightly difficult because if you obey in faith, God promises to bless. Hallelujah and amen. My roots are being an African Pentecostal. I love faith. I love the idea that God can bless you. And He does and He loves and He responds to faith. I'm not quite sure how it works. He's sovereign and merciful, but our acts done in faith bring God's blessing. But we don't do stuff for God to prosper us. We don't tick boxes so that God sorts out our problems because He also promises you this, you will have trouble in this life. So as we come to an end, in a moment, we're going to have communion. Oh, um, can I have my communion cup, please? Thank you. We're going to have uh, communion, but I want to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for a moment. And I just, as I read this, I want you to just pay attention to your emotional takeaway from this verse. Okay, familiar verses. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. How do you read that? Does this tone fit your view of this verse better? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Is that, man, for many years, that's how I would have read that. (laughs) Or does this tone fit it better? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is within you, God within you, whom you have from God. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Which tone do you read into the text? This buying of you is not so that you are a slave to whip around. This purchasing of you by Christ on the cross is so that he would dwell in you. That's so, so different. So in view of the fact that God's living in you, honor God with your body. Do you see the difference? He's as concerned with your holiness in either tone. But it's not so that you're just some person he can, at his whim, it's because he's dwelling in you and has chosen to make you his habitation. I can guarantee you, if my life is anything to go by, by the mercy of God, there have been some rough patches and some horrendous seasons in my life. But if you don't airbrush God, and I've done it, and we all do it in various ways, but on the whole, he, the fruit of my life, I'll testify to, it will be better than anything you could ever have imagined. It will not be convenient to you. It will cause you to uproot. Leave friends. Say no to wonderful opportunities that you think of. It will be costly. But on the other side, there is nothing like it. I wonder if you want to just get your cup ready. We're going to worship Jesus in a few moments. But I want you to think about this verse. I wonder if we can leave it on the screen. If you're at home and you've got communion, great. If you're not ready, that's okay. I think Jesus is bringing freedom right now. That often starts with the brokenness. Some of you are going to leave things behind today because for the first time through the haze of what you've seen is harshness. And I can't handle that, God. If I do that, you're seeing the real Jesus, the one whose body was broken on the cross to buy you so that he could live in you and be with 
you, not that he could cast you aside and slap you around the face. Not that he could point a finger, so that he could dwell in you. Holy Spirit, come in this room, every screen that's being watched, and help us. We can't count the cost without your help, revealing the wonder and the beauty of Jesus. So as we eat this wafer, this is for you if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you get to take communion if you're trusting and believing in Christ for the first time and saying, I believe your body was broken for me. If not, just hold, talk to us a bit more. Lord, we thank you that you have bought us. Not cheaply. You didn't just look for a bargain. You paid the ultimate cost willingly. Let's remember Jesus' body. As we drink the wine, it speaks, doesn't it, of the cleansing of Christ. We're washed whiter than snow. His bloodshed speaks of the wonderful cost. Eleni, I just felt the Lord. <laughs> I just felt the Lord wanted to say to you, He joyfully and willingly, without reservation, did this for you. And He has never He has never regretted it. And I can't communicate the sense of strength which I believe God wants to convey. That he has never, ever regretted it. Lord, we remember you. stand together. This series in Judges has been sobering. But the, sh the shadow, not the shadow, the, the, the light alongside the sober thing is like the gleaming light of dawn. You know how the dawn goes across the earth? Judges shows this God who is ever patient and increasingly merciful and kind and brings His light to bear everywhere. He shines in His majesty and His patience and His goodness and His kindness. Lord, we love You. Let's worship Him now. Maybe you need to confess, surrender, submit to God. Just tell Him the reality. Or maybe you just like struggling to see through it all now, but I, I, this is what I want, Jesus, to worship you truly. Tell him that and invite him to help you.